Game Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And we're back with Dr. Paul Matt Sutter. Now, okay, so Newton comes up with these laws. Whose shoulders does he stand on as far as understanding? Is this Copernicus? Is, you know, where does this come from? Right. Uh, Newton, when he arrives on the scene, is building on the work of previous generations. In the previous generations, uh, I don't point to Copernicus so much. I point more towards Kepler. Johannes Kepler had some very, very interesting ideas. And you can't see me roll my eyes as I say interesting, or maybe you can if you're watching the video. Um, by interesting, I mean absolutely crazy. Kepler was a kook. He was a weirdo. He had some uh, fanciful notions of how the universe works, but he had some very, very clear intuitions and he had a very, very sharp mathematical mind. Kepler was the first person, at least in the historical record, that threw it out there. That one, that there are regular patterns that we can use mathematics, very, very simple mathematics to describe the motions of objects in the heavens, and that maybe those mathematics are connected to the mathematics that we use to describe every day, the everyday existence. He was the first person to put that out there and to give it some serious backing. The way he took this was that he thought that because the planets were closer to heaven, that they were more harmonious and more in tune with the voice and will of the divine. And so by studying the motions of the planets and unlocking their deep mathematical structures, he could apply those mathematical structures and tell better fortunes because it was basically God talking to Kepler. We've kind of put that to the side and just kept his mathematical bits. Uh, but it was Newton that really put it all together, that wove it together, that yes, there are physical mathematical laws, simple ones that describe the motions of heavenly objects, and they are connected to the physics we use in everyday life. Now, how does this relate to observational science? In other words, Galileo comes out and says, um, I see this. Now, he was also famously... Um, not a jerk a jerk yes he was not nice to the pope and the pope was not nice to him is that the point where it begins to diverge where objectivity goes one direction and religion goes another even though that's not completely separate because of course the vatican does astronomy today but is that where where that that begins to diverge into enlightenment type thinking where you sort of set certain things aside Right. It's so fascinating to me to study and read about these early, I hesitate to use the word scientific, but proto-scientific thinkers, because the way they approached problems crossed all sorts of different disciplines. They would write treatises, they would have arguments based in mathematics, which we would recognize, based in physics, which we would recognize, based in religion and theology, and based in philosophy. And they would weave all these arguments together to build a coherent case against their opponents. And you might attack, say, the, the, the theological aspects of your opponent, uh, but maybe you'd agree on the mathematics or vice versa. And it wasn't until really like the 19th century that we started to see a strong separation between these disciplines where physicists worked on physics problems, mathematicians worked on math, theologians worked on theology, and philosophers worked on philosophy. Back in the day, they were all just mixed together. And so you have situations where Kepler and Galileo are contemporaries. They're total contemporaries. And Kepler is writing letters to Galileo and impressed by his observations. And Kepler is is telling Galileo like, yes, I agree with you. Of course, the earth goes around the sun. I've also figured out this deep geometric patterns that, that revealed the divine nature of God. Check this out. And Galileo's like, oh, I'm not 100% on board with that. Could you please stop 
sending me letters. How did you even get my address? And you have Galileo who uh, is making all these fantastic observations and getting into fights with the Pope and insists, insists that the Earth makes a perfect circle in its orbit, even though that doesn't match up with the observations and that Kepler's answer was better. And so you have this fascinating back and forth where you see how close they were like, oh, if you could take a little bit from the Kepler column and a little bit from the Galileo column, you have our modern picture of how the solar system works. But they they would disagree on these strange points that seem strange to us, but to them were totally valid. And then you get into things, you know, speaking of philosophy and <laughs> merging all these things, you, you come to Giordano Bruno, where he essentially is the first not the first, but he's essentially the major, first major proponent of the idea of life on other planets. Though I'm not sure he could have backed that up with anything. Nothing. Nothing. Giordano yeah. Bruno is perhaps the least interesting figure from this time, except for maybe some peasant farmer. He was the know. lithium, the lithium of the period. The lithium of yes, the, the, of the 17th century. Yes. No, uh, Giordano Bruno contributed absolutely nothing to astronomy. It's pretty clear that he didn't even read the work of Copernicus or keep up to date with Kepler and Galileo. He was off in a world doing his own little thing that had no connection to, you know, observational reality. Anything. Yeah. He, in, his, in essence, they were right. He was basically a heretic. He was a straight up heretic. <laughs> uh, which is what... Because yeah. he's like, I think there's lots of worlds and maybe Jesus didn't exist. I'm just going to put those together. And the Pope obviously is not going to take a liking to that. That's interesting because, you know, you see that name a lot, you know, in, in the history of science. You see Giordano Bruno cited, but I can't, I couldn't figure out what he was actually on about. <laughs> I... I, I, I know this was a big thing in uh, the latest uh, iteration of Cosmos. I don't see the point. Bruno, he, he is not, he's just not a player. Now in your, in your new book, you, you, you know, you touch on, on, on these things, the history of science. Who is the predecessor for, um, for Kepler and Copernicus? Who in the Middle Ages was actually thinking about the, the sort of thing that was the prototype of their thinking. What what do they trace back to? Right, so they trace back, you know, they upset the apple cart of a system of the universe where the earth was at the center and everything orbited, orbited around it. And then there was a shell of stars surrounding that. This model was put forth by Ptolemy in like the second century AD an ancient model that had been refined over the course of millennia, over the course of 1500 years, to get to the point where we are in the Renaissance and the beginning of the scientific revolution, where it was a very sophisticated, very well-oiled model that had a lot of flaws. But where people acknowledge that there's a lot of flaws, but said, you know, it's it's only a model. You know, it's it's just our attempts to predict where the planets are going to be so that we can do accurate navigation and more importantly, fortune telling. But they knew it was an issue, but they didn't know exactly how to move beyond it. And they didn't have a lot of reasons to move beyond it. They didn't have a lot of strong observations to move beyond it. You might, if you want, draw a parallel to our current situation where there are some big mysteries in the universe, like the nature of dark energy, like the unification of gravity with the other forces, where we know there's a problem, but we don't have a lot of observations and we don't have any compelling alternatives. So in other words, um, the Greeks were, they worked with what they had. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot of great things. I mean, obviously, you could determine the smart folks. Yeah, smart folks. But they just didn't have the observational equipment to go. I mean, they didn't even have a telescope, essentially. Um, so that it, it was there was a point in human history where it would be impossible to figure any of this out that we know now. Only through the progression of science and research could we do this. 
that was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now.